just just do anything that you think you should um, sort of just concentrate on. It may be just to go through the list as a test here, and the leg comes out. Both. <laughs> it's better there. But. Okay, so this is fairly well the same on him. So, do you jump up a minute? No, he's not bad. He's, he's quite stiff. So, I mean, to show something, he's quite limited. Let's um, take Virginia here. She, she shows this quite well. And then I'll show you a capsular pattern on myself. Okay, here we go. W which was created many years ago, actually, by somebody wrenching on my hip, demonstrating a particular manipulative maneuver. Won't tell you who it was, but we've always kind of laughed about it. <laughs> okay. If I come into this position here, I externally rotate the leg in a slight flexion position, abduction, so we're using a combination pattern of movement. And remember, this follows Friot's third law. First law was opposite flexion, uh, side flexion rotation. Second law was same side flexion. Third law is this, that if you take up movement in any one direction, movements in all other directions will be restricted. Maitland looked at that from a different point of view and said that if you've got movement restriction in a joint and you start to mobilize the least painful, probably all the others will improve somewhat. So that was like the reverse of that kind of thing, or looking at it from the other side. Now then, as far as the Faber is concerned, we'll come into a position there and produce the pain. So we come out here and that is painful. Now is it because I'm out flaring the hip? Or is it because I'm externally rotating the leg like this? So, if I take the strain off, just as soon as I stop hurting the um, hip, that's <coughs> where I will start my position. Now I take hold of the anterior aspect of the ilia and I increase the out flare. Now what's actually happening is we're reducing the stresses on the hip joint when I do this, but we're increasing the stresses on the sacroiliac joint. So that if I come into this position and it's painful, I lift up and it's just not painful now. I pick up the strain on the ilia now and it produces the same pain I would think of sacroiliac dysfunction. Whereas, to confirm this, as far as the hip is concerned, I could come out into the position like this and produce the pain. Then I could just ease off a little bit like this, take my hand under the ilia and put an in flare on it and then take the hip out into external rotation again, stopping the sacroiliac joint moving. Now this I think is a very useful differentiation of what is a sort of test over three or four joints. This is part of this business of going back and seeing can we modify tests to put stresses on one structure instead of the other structure that seems to be stressed by this test. And so this is a very useful way of looking at the Faber test and trying to eliminate little bits and pieces. So just try that and just work through it as you're coming through this examination protocol because this is really quite useful. Thank you. <clears throat> is that part of a general... I'm sure the father-in-law of Sir Reginald Watson-Jones very good book on Hugh Owen Thomas, written by David LeVay, who was one of the senior orthopedic surgeons when I was just a student in a hospital I was working at. And he wrote this book on um, Hugh Owen Thomas, and evidently this fellow kind of used to work like 18 hours a day, this is the early part of the century, in Liverpool in, in, in England. And when he died, evidently it was as if royalty had died. The people turned out, he'd got such a reputation. You know, he did surgery and he saw patients, then in his free time he developed all these splints, like the Thomas splint and all this kind of stuff. Very, very sort of prestigious uh, person. And it's kind of interesting that his father was, a, I think, a bone setter who did all kinds of things to patients. And this is where this whole business came from for rest can, can never be overdone. And the trouble was that what they were resting was tuberculous joints. And that was fine. But then when they put it into every other thing, we've been fighting this ever since. And now, you know, go to bed for a week. We've found, you know, that the first two days in bed is where you get your benefit. After that, it's downhill. 
And so it's kind of interesting to know where a lot of this stuff comes from. But that was a sort of a, I suppose, a, a reaction of a son against his father, for one thing, and then of seeing inappropriate things done for inappropriate diseases. But it was extrapolated into a whole lot of other things, which was not a good thing. And it's taken years and years to get rid of some of that stuff. But Huey Owen Thomas was very famous. But the Thomas test, okay, is just this, is to take the leg up into flexion just until the lumbar spine flattens against the bed and hold it there. And then just to simply look at the flexion of the other hip. In most people, and even in Kent here, there is not a major lift of the leg. If this is positive, we would see this. But it's not a matter of coming over the end of the bed and doing all the rectus and the um, psoas stretches. This is it, of coming up to here, holding there, and if we just do it to this point, then have a look at this, we will standardize once again this procedure. Whereas if you're looking at it over the end of the bed and pushing up like this as far as we can, and then looking at this, look at Ken, he's up in the air here, this is a positive one. But not in the sense if we just put our hands under, as soon as the back flattens, we hold it there, and we have a look at that. That standardizes, and keeping the leg in a neutral position, that standardizes the procedure, which is what we've got to do. Because I think we're all kind of using different, slightly different criteria now. So we can't even communicate with each other now, which is a bit of a shame. Okay, so that is the Thomas test, just done like that. So just sort of go over it just in that gentle way again, please. <laughs> Tests were built in a population that were not as fit as we are, <laughs> oh golly. These were a, a population that kind of worked physically probably much harder and probably were a bit tighter because of that. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Ober's test classically, classically, is this, as far as I was taught it, by Ober. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> just, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll just flatten the spine and just give ourselves a little bit of a stabilization from the other side, okay? And to bring the leg into a slightly abducted extended position to take hold of the foot here and to push down like that and see what the range is. But look at what's happening on the hip at the lumbar spine. So I think what is a reasonable modification of this test is to put the hand under the side here, do exactly the same thing, hold the pelvis like this, and then try just to come down in this position. So we don't get a lot of compensatory give of side bend in the spine. So that's how I would kind of come in and do that particular test. Yes? But your goal is to what is your I'm just looking at the iliotibial tract. That's all. Well, have you got another um, idea of what we're doing? And the tensor fasciolata and the insertions of the gluteus maximus into it. But essentially, what is the flexibility of, or the um, extensibility, I should say, the extensibility of the iliotibial tract? Well, in my case, in several that I've done, mm -hmm. it's very, it doesn't show positive unless you get that little bit of external rotation or get it to mm -hmm. a more neutral mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. Then it seems to be positive in more people. Mm -hmm. so which is what this would, track. which would, what this would sort of, just keep it in that neutral position there. You feel that we should be keeping it more like that? Well, just to do it in the first place because to get it more over Okay, the so, we, so, so just coming into extension there in abduction, then drop down, and that's where we should be, I think. And if we hold that there, this shows up much more positive in Jeff here than when we do it in sort of the standard way here and just get all that give in the spine. I don't think this is the way to stretch it, mind you, and I'll go over one or two of sort of excellent stretching techniques for this, but I think that's a reasonable thing. That's how most people, one of those variations, test this. I don't think we should be doing it particularly with the knees straight in this position because it's mostly done with the knee bent in some form or other. 
We've got um, some of the other things of Salmon, where you've got the patient laying on the back, and we can do some of these subsidiary tests in a minute. But just so that we've got more or less a fairly convenient examination pattern, I don't think we need to break into all kinds of subsidiary tests until we've made our mind up where to focus. This is the problem. You know, if when, for example, we do the Thomas test, and can you go on to your back a second? We come up here. Kent was saying that Yander feels all of us should be doing 135 degrees and holding it there. And this should give us the standard procedure. Certainly the Thomas test was until it just touched down, which in different people is going to be a different sort of level. Okay, and then to do this. If we find something positive, then of course we've got to start sorting out about the iliacus, about the psoas, about the difference between rectus and the psoas and so on. But not to stop now and start doing all that. I think we should try, scan, get our plan. Into the individual joints, get our plan. So what we're trying to do is to sort of gradually focus right the way down and not get sidetracked by all kinds of subsidiary tests on the way. And we all tend to do that a bit. But we sort of tend to shortcut. You know, oh, here we are, oh, now I'll start doing some stretching. This is a treatment for today. But in fact, it might not be what the real plan should be. And so I think if we can kind of focus and focus and focus and then decide, right, here are the possibilities. This is going to be my essential um, analysis, and this is what we, the procedures are going to be, and then we can test it against those things. All right. Are there any other things that um, we have got on there? That where are you at with the with the examination? Or we're still doing it. Okay, carry on then, and I'll keep stopping you from time to time when Chris gives me a little reminder. To doing this just as a just as a routine always. And, and put it into operation wherever we're doing this, either as a mobilizing as a, or as a test, that if um, I'm coming into external rotation, let's try and not go through the opposite hip to stabilize. So when he's coming up like this and he's coming over like this, and we can kind of do that, because that means I'm stressing over two sacroiliac joints plus the hip joint. I should be able to come into this position, just keep it hold this and make sure I stay on the same side. That's really important and that we stay more or less in neutral, which if Jeff doesn't like to do here. But try and get that as a routine, whether we're mobilizing or whether we are um, testing, that we don't stress other joints because that could kind of influence the findings and it could, of course, influence our opinion on what goes on here. All right? So just try as a routine and always do that, regardless of what you're doing. ourselves that perhaps we found some restriction, let's say, in that adduction in the Ober's test, or we found some restriction when we were looking at the Thomas test. And that when we push down or to keep Kent happy, we could go up a little bit more and just have a look at the sort of elongation, which is reasonable, to look at the end feel of muscle extensibility. And if with um, Kent I'll use, because he probably is a good example of this, right interesting thing that Kent's telling me that he knows he's not very flexible, and the only time he ever gets trouble is if he starts stretching himself. <laughs> if he leaves his body as it knows it is, he's okay. <laughs> All right, but say we've come into this particular position here, and I've taken the leg up, and I could then have a look at this. I could then perhaps take it up just a little further and just see, and with um, Kent here, I would think that he's sort of staying within reasonable ranges, knowing what the rest of his body is like here, when we sort of go through this testing procedure. And I think that this global flexibility thing is something that we should bear in mind, and kind of just test occasionally, you know, just to have a look at the non-dominant hand, and take the index finger back, does it go back to 90 degrees? Have a look at the thumb, and sort of pull it down here, does it touch the forearm? Come into the elbow here and have a look at, at a extension beyond the normal 180 degrees. Look at this, 
see whether it goes back excessively. Now his is really quite good of his shoulder, but looking at this, this is giving me an idea of his general flexibility. How many fingers can you get in your mouth? Okay, he's, there's another interesting case. He's a little bit more, I would think, than, say, 40 millimeters, probably because he talks a lot. <laughs> didn't say that. But I wouldn't have expected that. I would have expected perhaps a little less than he's doing there with his general flexibility. We can take hold of his hallux here, just lift up the leg here and have a look and see whether there is any genu recurvatum. Here. So there's a number of little tests that we can do to get a kind of an index of his flexibility if we're finding very excessive or stiff. And if it generally represents his body, perhaps this is his body type and we should be kind of happy with this. And whatever restrictions have to be placed on people with body types, perhaps we should be sort of looking at what those restrictions should be. Now then, all of you, I'm sure, are pretty familiar with most of the things that we do as far as around the hip for looking at flexibility. I mean, this is part of all courses, but we can just do it for the sake of argument here. I'll just take your shoe off here a second. So we've focused a little bit on a flexion, adduction, restriction here. So can you come down to the end of the table and a little bit more? don't know that these are necessarily the best positions to do the stretching in, but they're certainly good positions to conveniently um, do the um, assessments. Can you come down just a wee bit more? Okay. So that I can come up into a position here and just brace the leg back here and have a look at this. And now we start seeing much more of a restriction as I take this up into this position, as you can see. Now then, what is the finding that we would get if this was essentially rectus that was causing the problem? Perhaps the knee would extend, or the other way to do it is to take it down lightly into this position and then to flex the knee and see whether this comes up. That would be the other way of doing it. And that's what we see, which in this case it doesn't show up particularly. But when I do this, we can see that it's bringing the hip into more flexion. With the Ober's test, or the test for adduction in this position, just relax your leg a second. See that this is a little externally rotated on the tibia. Now if I move this across like this, we can have a look just back here. Let me just, can you let this foot go a little bit, or is that the normal position? Yeah, this might be the normal position. He walks a little bit like Charlie Chaplin, you must do. Okay, so as I come across here, what very often happens with a tight iliotibial tract is that this is taken into an external rotation position as I lightly pull across. But I've got to kind of stabilize things and I'm in a good position for doing this for testing, not particularly for treating but just for testing. We want some sort of convenient ways of just running through this so we can do a sort of composite in everything. Okay, so just have a little go just for my peace of mind that we're all doing all these things in as precise a way as possible. And of course, when we look at the hip joint, fundamentally, the muscles that we'll be looking at for tightness will be the psoas and the iliacus, the iliotibial tract, the hamstrings, and the adductors. The ones that weaken will be the abductors, and the quadriceps that work across one joint, particularly the vastus medialis. Rectus is a muscle that tightens. So that's the kind of generalized pattern that you find in the hip. And so, bearing that in mind, it would be sort of reasonable to look for that. So that if we find a restriction of adduction, the chances are, I think, more that it's likely to be the iliotibial tract mechanism than it's going to be the gluteus medius and minimus mechanism. They tend to weaken when they become dysfunctional. So just going on averages, then that would seem to be reasonable assumptions to make. And so if we can just very sensitively look at this without producing fantastic amount of compensatory movements, this is what we should um, try and really establish at this stage. And it shouldn't be a particularly distressful procedure. 
Although I do remember when, you know, the three days of stretching around the hip in mice, these people were walking really, really slowly. <laughs> I mean, it'd be like three days of exercise, I guess, for all of them. <laughs> okay, so let's just finish on that little um, theme. So try some of that, if you would. Thanks, sir. As I've been going round, and it may be a little repetitive because I don't know whether I sort of um, mentioned all of this, but can you come to the end of the table again? Ken, just down here. And just lay back again. All right, down a little bit more. All right. What we've seen is that when we come into this position here, that when we do various things and come back like this, this ilia is moving. Now in this position I can stabilize the lumbar spine perfectly well and I'm right over the joint that I'm trying to work so this is not going to be any great stress on me but I can also take my hand and get onto the iliac crest here and stabilize it down like this so that when I feel it's more the joint movement that's going on in the hip joint and not in this totally compensatory hip pelvis knee. I can cut out the Pel uh, the uh, lumbar spine this, I can cut out the pelvis there and now I'm in a much better position to see what happens in the hip joint. And this is a very useful thing as I come across here and I feel this to get some sense of lack of extensibility. Now this wouldn't be the way to stretch it but we're only looking for when this starts to move and when this starts to move if I really try and stabilize it and now I can't get any more movement then the only movement I can get is if I let this go a bit I know that I should get more adduction than this and so I would then perhaps go into my stretching pattern now I only bring up the hamstrings from one point of view because it's a very stiff group generally speaking and the question with the hamstrings is, you know, when are we going to start to sort of assess hamstring stiffness? Now, it's kind of interesting with Ken here because these are not so bad as I would have thought from the other side. Now, the question I think here is, what do we do with the lumbar spine? And I think the lumbar spine should always be lordosed, whether we are mobilizing it or whether we are testing it. Now, whether you feel it's adequate just to ask the patient to put their arm underneath, a little bit more if you can, so as to fully support that, uh, again like that. Then we come up like this, and now I'm starting to check. I'm starting to get a motion now of the ilia going backwards, so that is probably the point that I should take. I've tried to eliminate flexion of the, or backward rotation of the ilia, and then, of course, flexion of the lumbar spine, which is compensatory to a tight hamstring. And, of course, that's where we see a lot of the problems, isn't it? With all of the people that have been told to stretch the hamstrings. If they don't do it in the presence of a lordotic spine, all they're going to do is to get hypermobility in the low lumbar spine. And so, as a test, I think if we can do that, we can hang on to just not so much hang on in terms of pulling it forward, although I guess we could do that. I normally just put my fingers on top and wait till that starts to move. And that's where I would assess this. Then we can do something about stretching it, but all we're trying to do is to get something that we can all agree on in terms of precision of these testing procedures. Now, the other thing, and then we'll have a, a coffee break, is has anybody got any decent system for measuring this? I mean, if I'm holding here and doing this, what am I going to do? Have my goniometry in my teeth? I mean, how do I sort of do all this, make sure that everything stays, and then take the measurement? So what kind of goniometers have we got? I mean, well, for all of them we're talking about. Do you use a tape for everything? Well, for this one, I'm just trying to, if I'm doing, I'm trying to assess lower limb tension signs and mm -hmm. things, I'll just measure from the lateral malleolus to the tabletop. Okay. Just for my own basic yeah. knowledge yeah. of how they're getting yeah. better okay. and more reactive. I don't measure, I never yeah. measure goniometry. Yeah, again. okay. I, I think that the Workers' Compensation Board in the state of Oregon, and perhaps I'm wrong, has a test that you, uh, that you put the hip... Can you come here? 90 degrees. Yeah. Like this. And then you put your fluid filled goniometer on, on mm. top and then you stretch it. 
and then yeah, and measure it over the, yes. yeah, yeah, okay. And this would be the angle. Yeah. See, the bad thing about that is that some people may put it in 95 and some people may put it in 100. It's a problem. Yeah, they yeah. Hit. yeah my yes. got to, it's standardized there. You've got to be standard at 90. Yeah, yeah you have to be standard at yeah. 90. Yeah, and keep it at 90. Yeah, that's the good thing. I've, I've kind of um, been experimenting a little bit with um, goniometers or you know, just devices that carpenters use, uh, fluid filled things. They're a lot cheaper if you buy them from a, a decent woodwork store, you know, for 25 bucks, you can get their very best model, which is kind of moves around, the Betzel moves very nicely and all this. Um, the other thing that I've wondered, and I, I think I might write to them and ask them if I could just try it, because I've got this like 30-day 30, 30 trial to send it back, is that, I don't know whether you've ever seen any of these spirit levels, the big long ones, that instead of having the little um, um, thing, bubble that goes up the little tube, they've now got electronic models. And these electronic models measure, you know, whatever angle. Now, I don't know if we lifted the leg up here and we have this little electronic thing on, whether we could just kind of hold it there and it would just measure that perfectly well. These in Canada would be a lot cheaper here, but in Canada they're about $100. But I found out how much they wanted for an electronic goniometer and it was something like $1,500. And I said to this woman, I, was, I wasn't abusive to her, but I said, how do you think we can afford these things? So this is only to test patients with. It's not to actually treat anybody. <laughs> and you know, she has a silence on the other end. And I said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to sort of speak to you like that. But I mean, it's just getting ridiculous. Especially as I'd got an advert that was only three years old, and this thing was about $800. And even then I thought it was pretty steep. But I was going to be willing to sort of cough up, but not at 1500 in three years. That seems to me to be excessive. So, I don't know how we do this. I mean, we're talking about standardized tests. We're talking about standardized measurements. Everybody wants outcome measures. How do we do this? My um, college in, um, in Alberta, the College of Physical Therapists, are constantly talking about records. And this is the big thing when we have disciplinary hearings. It's about inadequate records. And then we see people that have got great records, but when you read through, it doesn't really tell you anything. Now, we haven't got measurements that can be judged or anything like this. How are we going to go about doing these outcome measures? I think this is a major problem of how we can we measure this stuff properly. I don't know, there is, I saw one from Utah in the back letter, which was kind of two things you clipped on, and I guess in some way these two things could measure the difference of distance between the two electronically. But um, I, I rang them up and the guy was going to ring me back and he didn't, and I thought, ah, can't be a good firm under these circumstances, so I've never followed it up. But I'm, I'm sure that's going to be a couple of thousand bucks at the very least. And does it only tell movement in one plane? Or can you rotate it and do all the rest? I don't know. So this is a big problem. Chris and I have been conned into buying the same piece of equipment, which is the Brom and the Crom, the cervical range of movement and the back range of movement and it's beautifully packaged in these great big cases all in stuff and you look at these slender things and you think geez is this really going to stand up to clinic use where it's dropped on the floor and somebody stands on it and you know all of this kind of stuff if you've got to unpack it and then fit it all back into these special compartments for each little bit you know this is a problem with all of this stuff we've got to have stuff that is user friendly you know and I don't think it's out there at the moment. So we've got all these kind of very precise positions, but while we're holding them, we've got to have some way of measuring it. And then I think we're going to be a lot better off in terms of perhaps looking at outcome measures. But as um, Brian was saying, you know, do you really make all that much difference when you're stretching people?